Okay. All right, so uh, all right, so oh, let's see. Do you know how I um, remove this top bar from here from my screen? Is that this is crazy. I've had this problem. I don't know how to get rid of this top bar. So I mean, yeah. Okay, so. Where were we last time? Uh, remember what happened last time was that uh, Arjuna and uh, uh, Arjuna is at in a war with his cousins, and he is completely uh, confused. Uh, but initially, basically, the confusion starts in a way where Krishna he tells Krishna his friend uh, who is uh, riding his chariot. He basically tells him that, hey, you know, I would like to see who all am I fighting. Can you just take me to the middle of the battlefield? And uh, Krishna, being Krishna, um, he um, he plays a little bit of a mischief, I think, uh, but it, but deliberately uh, to bring some uh, discussion on <laughs> uh, at least uh, some confusion or a dilemma in Arjuna's mind. So what he does is he takes the chariot right in front of his grandpa and his teacher. They both are very beloved to uh, Arjuna, and um, and that sets about this whole uh, depression in uh, uh, in Arjuna. Uh, so he basically says, uh, "Krishna, how the heck am I going to kill my grandpa? I have played in his arms, and uh, how am I going to kill my teacher? I love him." Um, and now he had other people that uh, Krishna could have taken the chariot right in front of them, like uh, Duryodhana, his cousins who he hated, uh, or anybody, any other hundreds of people there. Uh, but he chooses to put him right in front to let this sink in Arjuna's mind that he is not fighting a regular battlefield. So this is not a first time that he has gone to battlefield. Uh, he has fought many wars. He has killed many people. Uh, and... Uh, but now it has he has to fight with his own uh, family. And uh, had the chariot been taken right in front of Duryodhana, the cousin uh, who he hates, um, he would have probably not had any qualms at all. And he would have uh, like, okay, yeah, let's go for it. Um, so, uh, so Krishna basically brings him into a state of uh, dejection. And uh, Arjuna basically says, oh my God, I, I don't think I can fight. Why do we have to fight? You know, why don't we, uh, uh, like, you know, just just give up the arms? And you know, what is the point in fighting this uh, a war? All our loved ones are going to get killed, and I'm not sure if I'm going to uh, let that sin carry on my head uh, for the rest of my life. I would rather go to the mountains and uh, completely renunciate, and you know, just be a yogi or a sadhu or a, or a monk. And um, so Krishna basically starts uh, yelling at him, saying, "You know, this is just you. You're you're ridiculous. I mean, you you came up to this point, and uh, you are speaking something that has been uh, mechanically put in your head. Because what happens a couple days prior to this is uh, Duryodhana's father has tried to convince Arjuna, like, look, you know, what is the point in fighting? It's just a kingdom. Why can't we be the king? And, you know, you go find some other place and, you know, you guys are nice people, blah, 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 right? All of that. And so uh, it almost, uh, to Krishna, Krishna reminds him that, is this really your view or are you just trying to posture somebody else's uh, views? Because if it is really your view, let me tell you what is an intelligent man. What is a wise man? You know, you want to be wise by, you know, you're talking about uh, peace and you want to go to the jungle and you want to be a monk, all of that. Well, let me explain what that means. Uh, so he goes through this whole uh, thing about like, hey, you know, there are two paths. You know, one is direct knowledge and the other is, you know, going through different kinds of uh, yogic uh, activities and all of that, right? Um, so... So one of them being, hey, look, I I already know, like the 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 all everybody is going to die eventually, and uh, so that that was the Sankhya uh, philosophy, right? So where you're not really so worried about uh, 
the uh, the current uh, situation of uh, you know uh, human beings and all of that, right? So you you're thinking at a much higher level, which is uh, you know you you have attained the knowledge and uh, you know you you we talked about the prakriti and the uh, purusha, right? So uh, you're much more closer to the purusha, uh, the atman, and and you're you're just like cool about everything and you know you you fight the thing you fight the war whatever is required but you don't have any kind of uh, uh, desire uh, to win or lose and that is not really confusing your mind so that is one approach right so the other approach is the yoga approach um where uh, where he says that hey look you know you have to do your karma do your duty whatever has come to you you are known to be such a great warrior and uh, you know, not many times does a warrior gets uh, a, such a great opportunity to do something good on this planet. And you're going to be helping the whole society if you fight this war, war. But if you give up, it is going to be a disgrace for you. It is going to be a disgrace uh, for everybody. The bad elements in the society will continue hurting the people. Uh, so, you know, don't worry so much about all of this. So, so he takes... Uh, Arjuna through a variety of different uh, um, uh, types of, uh, you know, um, uh, arguments. Um, so, so he has, at the end of this, he has given him basically two different uh, paths. Uh, so let me minimize this. Uh, he has given him like um, uh, Sankhya, the knowledge, path of resolute wisdom, is one irresolute has too many confusing paths, right? So that's what he tells him. Everything you see is purusha and prakriti, right? So everything can be broken down into the soul or the uh, paramatma or the God, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, the consciousness. And prakriti is everything that we see, right? Mind, body, the nature, right? And and everything is a mixture of these uh, three different elements, right? Tamas, Rajas, and Sattva. We'll cover that again later on. Everything gets recycled. Our irresoluteness and sorrows are due to our focus on dualities, right? So in his mind, he was thinking, if I win, a lot of my family members are going to get killed. And so he's already sort of uh, uh, has this notion in his mind that he's such a great warrior and he is definitely going to be winning this war, right? So he's already said that in his mind that that causes a bit of a problem for him. Uh, in the light of this wisdom, religious rituals to go to heaven are like a well, uh, like a well, like a water well during a flood, right? So, so if somebody had this kind of a sankhya knowledge, then you know, like uh, you know, he says, right? He says, look, let's think about this. Let's be wise about this. Let's not fight in this fight this war. So, what Krishna says is, true wisdom. If you really have true wisdom. Uh, so, sorry, Arjuna also says like, oh, look, you know, if I if I do this, many of my generations, according to our scriptures, they are going to go to hell. And, you know, there they will be a lot of uh, chaos in the society, right? Uh, so he says, like, uh, he talks about heaven and hell, uh, as if that is like some uh, true wisdom, uh, in a way. Uh, so uh, Krishna corrects and says, you know, if you really, really, really think you have the wisdom Wise people do not worry about heaven and hell. Uh, so that is kind of like, you know, when there's so much water, you're worried about a small well, right? So that's not what happens. And then the second path he tells him is, you know, you're definitely not here, but you are a warrior. So you have, you want to do the actions that is going to help you and help the society. So uh, that uh, causes a bit of a confusion. Uh, in Arjuna's mind, and and I I bet it's a, there's a confusion in our mind too, right? So chapter three and four they go into this thing uh, which is called as karma yoga. So karma yoga, we're going to talk more about that. Uh, and uh, in English, I guess you could call it the yoga of the works or yoga of action is what I call it. And um, uh, so, by the way, we are looking, we are reading uh, the translation by Arvind Ghosh. Um, or one of the uh, eminent scholars in India back in the days, uh, like around 1800s, late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, so there, there are many, many translations available. N no one translation is better than the other. Every, everybody is great. There is so many different opinions and so many different uh, ways to look at this. 
in a lot of the times, you know, what we see is really what is made up, um, you know, uh, what, what, our, what our mental makeup is, right? So we tend to see, and for me, coming to Gita really has uh, uh, so many different uh, reasons, uh, uh, you know, because of all the things that are going on in my world, uh, but also the attack of technology that is happening over us, right? I don't call it that attack because I myself am a tech worker. <laughs> I developed the technology, which is kind of taking us away from ourselves, right? So that is the point of uh, me coming back to Gita. Um, so Arjuna says, if thou boldest the intelligence to be greater than works, O Janardana, you know, Janardana is uh, Krishna's other name. Why then dost thou... Okeshava oh, is another name, appoint me to a terrible work, like killing this stuff. You know, you're really uh, confusing me. Um, so then the blessed Lord said, now here, you know, throughout this um, Gita, you will notice that they will never use the term uh, direct name of uh, the, the friend, Krishna, right? So they always use this term, blessed Lord. Now, let, let's talk a little bit about that, right? So I think it is key that what they are doing is Arjuna, they always call Arjuna, but they never call the other person whatever his human name was. Um, and the point there being that um, really Krishna at that point, and there are so many different ways to interpret this. I have my own personal interpretation about this where it could just have been Arjuna's self um sort of self-talk, right? So he he had sort of like in, in, his own internal uh, knowledge must have really presented to him and this is his inner dialogue. But it could very well have been his friend Krishna who is outside of these uh, two uh, the brothers in, in the civil war that is happening. So he could probably think straight than Arjuna. And when when we say like, when somebody is able to speak straight, they typically, um, um, are not speaking because they don't have any motivation per se. They are not, they don't have any desire. They don't care if, if uh, somebody wins or loses. So whatever is coming is really coming from deep within. And, and the way to think of this is, you know, we have talked about this in many other topics in the past, like uh, Drigrisha Viveka or the seer and scene uh, type of discussions where we talk about consciousness, right? So one that is even beyond, so there is senses, senses beyond senses are mind, beyond mind there is intellect and beyond intellect there is consciousness. And the, because that consciousness kind of streams through all of these paths, can we talk and we can touch and we can, you know, uh, experience this whole world. And um, somebody can speak directly through mind uh, out of desire or out of malice, out of spite or whatever, right, uh, then it doesn't ring as so, so truthful. Uh, so blessed Lord here means that it is coming from deep within. You know, it's not just Krishna. It is something more than Krishna that is trying to uh, talk to Arjuna at this point, right? In this world, twofold is the self-application of the soul by which it enters into the Brahmic condition. Uh, as I before said, oh, sinless one, right? So here he calls him sinless, uh, you know, just to kind of let the guards drop down and, you know, he can feel uh, less of a guilt or for whatever he's doing and try to understand this in a little more purest form. Um, uh, you know, there, there is a, uh, what is that? What is it called? The uh, re, uh, There's a way to approach a criminal or somebody who has done something bad where you can say something negative and you basically push them away, but you can uh, uh, give him a positive reinforcement, right? So this is kind of like that, right? So positive reinforcement. So suddenly they start thinking in a different direction. Um, and so he says that the uh, that of the Sankhyas by the yoga of knowledge, that of the yogins by the yoga of works, right? So there is the knowledge and then there is work. These are the two distinctions that he makes. And if you think about all the different religions, right? Um, there is, a, um, or actually different philosophers or, you know, any kind of uh, 
and achievement that you would see in spiritual uh, area, uh, they always break down into these two paths, if you will. Uh, so uh, if you think about Socrates or Plato or Buddha for that matter, or Mahavira from India, they were very much about knowledge, right? So they were just saying that this is all you need to know, life is suffering, and just do this and that's it, right? Now, yoga of works, you know, they, they, where there is a lot of rituals in that religion, a lot of uh, uh, hierarchies and all of that stuff, right? So because there are these so many things that you have to go through before you get there. Uh, so one, one depiction of that, one of the swamis, what he does is he says, um, Sankhya or the knowledge path is kind of like turning on a bulb in a, in a completely dark room. That's all you need. You need just that lay of uh, ray of uh, sunshine, and that's all you need to get your uh, get get the knowledge. While there are a whole bunch of religions that kind of, you know, say there are so many efforts that you have to go through. There's a, these different levels that you have to go through, right? So that's what uh, Krishna is talking about, right? So there are two different paths, not by abstention from works, right? So which is what he was trying to do. Does a man enjoy actionlessness? This is really, really key. Uh, there are three states of action. One, is, actually four, I would say. Um, one is action, where we just do something. Uh, there is the inaction, which is not doing anything, which is laziness, right? Then there is, um, uh, what is it? Reaction, right? So, so somebody pulls that action out of you. And... The fourth state is the actionless state. This is what karma yoga is all about, right? Actionlessness is about, you know, all of these three earlier things that I talked about, action, reaction, or uh, inaction, they all come from a certain level of desire. Uh, and that desire kind of uh, will uh, put you into the bondage of whatever um, a thing that you are trying to achieve through that action, whatever your goal was. And so that goal is going to either make you happy. And once you're happy, you're going to eventually become sad <laughs> because that happiness is not going to last for too long. Um, so, so the point that Krishna is going to try to make is not by abstention from works, does a man enjoy actionlessness? And this actionlessness has nothing to do with not doing actions. Uh, it is more about doing actions but um, without any desire for the rewards. Remember in, uh, in, the, um, in the earlier chapter in uh, verse 47, this is sort of like one of the famous uh, quotes in at least in Sanskrit, uh, but thou hast a right to action, but only to action, right? We all have rights to action, but that's it. You cannot say that I have the right to whatever the reward was at the end of it. So um, uh, never to its fruits. Let not the fruits of thy works be thy motive, right? This is what makes that action actionless. Um, and neither let there be in thee any attachment to inactivity, right? So this is the inaction. So he basically lays out in 47 exactly what karma yoga is. And this is, most Indians will know that, uh, that rhyme there. Um, nor by mere, mere renunciation of works does he attain to his uh, perfection. Um, okay, so this one, right. So uh, Siddhi here means like, you know, any any act, you know, you know, it can mean a lot of things. You know, it could, it could mean people walking on <laughs> uh, water surface. Uh, that, that's not what, uh, that's not how I understand it. I understand it more in the sense that let's say we all have certain expertises. So we have certain expertise because we have worked on it, you know, like uh, Mal uh, uh, Gladwell, right? Malcolm Gladwell, he basically has that book, we are 10,000 hours. So somebody who has gone through this much of a uh, study of a topic, he certainly has this siddhi or perfection in that area versus other, other uh, um, uh, things. And, you know, so he basically says that not by mere ren renunciation does he attain to his perfection, right? So we all have something is what Krishna is trying to say. We all have something. And when you just run away from things because they are going to uh, make you more 
uh, you know, ready for, let's say, heaven or something, uh, you, you're not really fulfilling what you, the reason you are here on this planet. You know, you all have, uh, we all have something to give to this world. Uh, so we better stay in, the, in this world is what he's saying. Uh, he who controlling the senses by the mind or Arjuna without attachment engages with the organs of the action in yoga of action, uh, he excels, right? Controlling the senses. So um, let's see here. I think I have a... Um, yeah. Okay. I think this one. Yeah. Um, so... Okay, we 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 have talked about this many times, right? So one one of the one of the neat things about Bhagavad Gita is, um, we started our you know at least I started the lecture series here with Vedanta, right? So Vedanta is like the highest form of Indian philosophy, and I would say, it tops, <laughs> and this is not I mean it's just it's just uh, mind blowing. Like I I was never introduced to it when I was growing up. I only lately got introduced to it and I was just completely amazed by what it has to say. Uh, and, and a lot of people, a lot of the philosophers around the globe seem to uh, want to understand what this is, right? Uh, so we have, um, so what Bhagavad Gita does is it takes a lot of these Vedanta concepts and it, they, there are so many Upanishads, right? So we talked about 108 or plus Upanishads, right? There's, there's more than 108, but those are sort of like the core important Upanishads. So those books are very dense and, and they, they are very good too, obviously. But what Bhagavad Gita does, it just takes everything and makes it ready for you. It's a, it, just, it just has all the information that you need and uh, it just brings it into a very succinct format. Uh, and uh, that's why it is loved by everyone. But then the terminology used all over is also about um, God and religion and all of that. So it got appropriated by a lot of religious uh, uh, segments in India and they started uh, in, a, in a way abusing it. Uh, so, you know, you have the caste system or you you have races, you know, all kinds of things that started happening that, uh, you know, uh, people could blame that to this book. But be, that is mostly because nobody really reads this book for the intended purposes. And it is the priests who take this book and pinpoint small pieces here and there and try to control the masses. Right. So that which is what was going on back then. Um and maybe now too, right? I mean, even uh, even today, Indian religion, the way Indians pray and Hinduism uh, is, is very um, orthodox. It's not really what Vedanta wants to say. It is definitely not what Krishna was trying to talk about in Bhagavad Gita. You know, we still have a lot of these deities being uh, praised and prayed and all, all of that stuff, right? So there's too many rituals that happen. And most of these rituals tend to be like, hey, God, here I am, I'm doing this ritual, uh, get my son job that he wants, or uh, get my daughter a kid or whatever, something or the other, right? So the, it's all about like God is as if uh, some contractor, right? You're, you're just assigning God a task. <laughs> uh, so uh, anyways, so um, so we, we have talked about this, right? So objects in the world, there is the senses that uh, tend to uh, understand this object, right? Lights basically means that we can detect the object. Mind is also through the senses trying to understand the world, right? And then all of this, the light really comes from our consciousness. Had there not been consciousness in us, uh, the mind or senses, none of these were of, they would not exist basically, right? Uh, so would the objects, the objects would not exist either. Um, so let's talk about this further. Uh, human condition, right? So our condition, we follow orders of our senses. We do not give command. Uh, sorry, we do not command our body. Uh, there's a typo there. Self itself is unknown, right? So remember in uh, seer and seen, we talked about like, who is the seer and who is the seen, right? So what happens is our whole uh, world is based around mind. We think mind is the boss and we understand this. This is me and that is you. Those are the others out there. And we don't understand this concept of like, there's somebody else, something else more than mind that is allowing mind to 
understand the world, right? So self is unknown and uh, mind constantly gets into uh, all kinds of dilemma like Arjuna has. Um, we are basically collections of perceptions, desires, uh, and always suffer, right? So this actually, um, I came across this phrase in uh, one of the writings by David Hume as well, uh, where he says, uh, like he goes to uh, Greece to this temple. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of that temple, but uh, he goes there and there, there is written, there's carved up this big, uh, in big letters, know thyself. Uh, and, uh, and he is trying to muse on that, like, oh, what does that mean? Know thyself. And, you know, he starts looking within and he basically says, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing, literally everything is just made up in my mind, you know, everything is just like, it's, it's God knows what the self is that they are talking about the, the Greek. Um, and so we always are suffering, right? Um, and even, even when we have pleasure of whatever activity that we might be doing, that pleasure doesn't last for too long. And of course, sorrows, we are not really happy about them. Um, so know thyself. Um, so let's break down this action a little bit in, you know, like, three or four different categories here. Um, so um, our action typically, one is something that we need, right? You know, we're hungry, so we go eat food or, you know, we have to work, we have to earn money and then, you know, use that to uh, survive. That in Indian language, you would call it as Kriya, um, life's need. Um, then comes life's wants. So this is where now you have something like food and everything, but now you have, you want these uh, to, uh, you know, bigger house, I guess, or whatever, right? That is absolutely not a need, but a want. So there's a desire. And um, uh, so, uh, so the, the, this is what uh, the Indian scriptures would call as karma, right? Um, and this is what gets accumulated. And, you know, because you're doing this, you might be hurting the planet. You might be hurting yourself. You think you might be doing something good while you're doing this because you, your ego might be getting boosted while, we, while you're doing something good on, in this world uh, uh, without anybody's asking or wanting to, wanting you to. <laughs> that is also karma, right? So that is also causing some problems. Um, getting rid of the doer. Right, so this notion of I am doing it, which is what uh, Krishna is going to come to, is the karma yoga, and then finally, just being you know, so so later on, I talk about like there are two kinds of prayers that happen in Indian language, right? Uh, sorry, in Hinduism, one is you pray to God because you want something, so you want, um job or you want to have kid, all that stuff, right? So those are the ritualistic stuff. That is part of the Veda, uh, the initial part of the text that comes along uh, in the scriptures. And there what happens is you're asking God to give you power. You're asking God to give you Shakti uh, in Indian language, right? So that is the power to do something on this planet, right? And, and the God will grant your wishes. Uh, so um, the, the other kind of prayer is where you are you are sort of like you look at the futility of this uh, everyday stuff and you want to feel liberated and you know about like uh, you know people who have felt liberated you know in it has nothing to do with belongings or anything like that right so that liberation that you feel uh, is the other path which is also in indian language it would be called as mukti uh, which is the freedom path. The first is Shakti, the power path, and the second is Mukti, right? Uh, so, so here you are knowing oneself is trying to decode your day-to-day -day actions and you coming to a point where you kind of feel liberated uh, from this bondage of uh, the desires. Um, so, um, so one, so Krishna goes through this stuff in the in the two chapters. Um, so there is the um, the so called intelligent will. Uh, intelligent will is like you know I. One is like you know many a times we just don't know about the other side, so we tend to blindly uh, exist uh, in doing things right on this planet, and um, but there there is a way for you to kind of like push back and say, look, wait. I, I want to do this. Why am I wanting to do this? And then that, that is where 
your will plays a very important role. And in, in Indian language, it would be called a sankalpa. Like, you know, I am deliberately choosing not to do that, right? So now you're going in a different path. Uh, reads the desires. Desires is also the other word for this is uh, vasana. Uh, so uh, so the, the current state that most of us are, are in is where we have no control, right? So mind has no control over the senses. Senses are almost autonomously responding to the objects, right? Um, you know, one typical example one of the Swami gives is uh, about uh, a cigarette smoking habit, right? Uh, the cigarette smoking habit, many a times your fingers would just go get the cigarette and then just um, light it and put it in your mouth, right? Without even thinking. There's so many things that we do without thinking, right? You know, while we are driving or whatever. Only when uh, like a very close, you come very close to hitting something or whatever, do you suddenly realize, oh my God, what, what happened, right? So now you have moved from senses to actually the mind and the intellect and all of that stuff, right? So, so it takes some time for you to kind of navigate this. Uh, so right now, our typical most, uh, most of the time, we are in the state of vasana, uh, where um, the uh, senses are uh, driving us, right? So the first thing you want to do is control the senses, right? So when you control the senses, you come uh, closer to the mind. And here is where in the mind, what happens is you have these two paths that you can take. You know, here, here's a desire that has come about and I want to do this. And if I want to do this, what are the repercussions, right? So you there, there's positive way of doing it, negative way of doing it, whatever, right? So here is where you are choosing a particular path uh, with a conscious decision, right? That is what uh, the, 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 con the translation is gonna call as intelligent will. Now, definitely this is not suppression, right? So he's gonna talk about that. Um, then you want to, uh, once you have controlled your senses, now you're in the mind, but then you also want to control this mind. And you know, I, I forgot to show the block here, but it would be intellect, right? So here, you know, the mind would say, okay, well, I, I really wish I would do this and that's not gonna hurt anybody. And it's really like, I wanna do it, right? So this is where the brain has to be stepped in, right? And he is going to say, or she is, <laughs> intellect is going to say, um, well, wait a second. Why, why do you want to do this? Is this really what you need? Blah, 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 right? This is again, part of that intelligent will. And the, so karma yoga becomes dhyana yoga. This is where you really need that uh, mindfulness uh, for doing you know, the first thing and also the second thing, concentration, uh, contemplation, right? And then, um, then what, what happens is even that intelligence, if you think that you are smart enough to control your mind and senses, it can lead to egoism. And that ego itself, it can lead to so many other problems uh, uh, like anger uh, and uh, so many other issues. It's just, just crazy amount of issues, right? So this is where um, the, the fourth path that Krishna covers eventually. So here, this is a good summary of what is coming in the next uh, 18 chapters, right? Uh, rest of the thing. So karma yoga in the whatever next, uh, next few chapters, then comes the dhyana yoga, and then comes the bhakti yoga. A bhakti yoga is where you're saying like, look, whatever I am doing, I am letting it go in the sense that I, I don't care about what I'm winning out of this. I'm, I don't care about what I'm gonna lose out of this. Whatever I'm doing is I'm doing for, if you believe in God, you can say I'm doing it for God, or you can say that, hey, look, I, I'm not the doer. It is happening. And one of the things about uh, that is, um, so, so th through all of this path, ultimately, uh, you are going to get to the knowledge. This is the gyan, right? This is the sankhya knowledge. So it takes, if you take this other effort route, this is where you're going to come. And it is necessary for you to go through all of these steps before you can say that, you know, you have uh, reached uh, this stuff. So we will talk more about that over over time. Um, and not desiring uh, doesn't read it ever, right? So you say, okay, okay, yeah, you know, I'm not going to uh, do this, right? I'm going to force myself to not do this. Well, it's going to come back in way more perverted uh, fashion. Um, so the year, 
uh, yeah, one of the Swamis, he talks about Veda as knowledge and Vedana is the suffering. Suffering is also like, you know, suffering is when we know that that thing exists, right? You, your, your hand is pricked or whatever, you know, oh my God, you know, I, my hand, right? <laughs> uh, so we are conscious about the body when the body is unhealthy. So when the body is unhealthy, you, you feel the existence of your leg, toe, whatever. If you're just healthy, uh, sorry, if, if, you're, if, you're, if your toe is unhealthy, that's when you notice that there's a toe on your feet. Otherwise, it's just not there. Um, so um, similarly, the, the constant feeling of I, according to Hinduism, is sort of a sign of unhealthy mind. So when you are just in the zone, they say, right? You know, in the zone, you're working and you're doing something. And when you're doing that, there's a certain kind of a bliss. Well, it could be some, uh, um, some whatever activity that you're doing in the garage or cooking or whatever, right? So um, there, you know, suddenly your eye has vanished. Now, there's nothing for you to show off to anybody. There is no pretension, nothing whatsoever, right? So you're just doing your activity. There's a certain amount of joy that comes about, uh, right? Uh, but most of the time, the way we operate is because we uh, try to look for validation from other people for everything that we do. Uh, you know, we are constantly uh, putting a layer of whatever on top of that, right? And it's uh, it's according to Hindu scriptures, that is a uh, unhealthy mind. Um, so we uh, we make our eyes stronger. Uh, so I is not just this body, right? So what we are so much in I that we start increasing the um, the uh, circumference of it, if you will, right? So you will get a house, you will get more family, more friends, you know, property, wealth, all of that stuff, right? Now suddenly your eye has expanded, and and what that also shows is that we are not really meant to be limited you know we want more that is the really true nature of us which is we want to be infinity <laughs> and that is what vedanta sort of concludes right you know that you are you are so rich but you act as if you're a poor person you're you're this person who is suffering on this planet but you are this infinite consciousness and that is what you know you want to realize and not be limited by these desires and uh, things that uh, bring you down. When we lose them, we sadden because our eye is weakening, right? So if, if a family is dying, so in this case, Arjuna's uh, uh, father, grandfather is gonna be killed or his teacher is gonna kill. Now, is he really sad for that person to, uh, to be dead? No, he says, these are my, this is my grandfather. So I am gonna lose something. Arjuna is gonna lose something, right? So it is more about, I becoming weaker. And, and then what we do is most every action we take, we rationalize. You know, that is where we use the brain for. We use our intellect so, so that the intellect basically who should be the boss of the mind, we make the intellect the servant of mind. And if the mind wants to do something bad, the, the intelligence will say, ah, you know what? Rich people do this all the time. They are way more corrupt. Government does this, blah, 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 right? We rationalize it, it as good. Now, in this case, uh, the example of death, you know, we say we miss them and or, or you know, my family needs me and so I need to be this and all of that stuff, right? But it is all about this I. This is what we need to realize is what Krishna is going to uh, tell Arjuna, right? Or he has been telling him. Um, so we, uh, let's go back to our, reading here so he who control with sacrifice the lord of creatures of all okay yeah so here he basically says he who controlling the senses by the mind so this is where he kind of like it it, it talks about all the stuff that we have talked about now uh, so he's going to cover that in many different other ch chapters similar thing um but now he what he's doing is he's going into um by doing works otherwise than for sacrifice, right? Anything that you do. So I personally don't like this terminology sacrifice, um, but uh, but this author chose to use sacrifice uh, because sacrifice tends to be more like, hey, look, I have sacrificed. So, so there is still that I, but I would rather call it as offering. But in Indian language, this is called as yagna. 
and we we don't talk about it, right, that right uh, so by doing works otherwise than for sacrifice this world of men is in bondage to works so whatever karma you do whatever action you do if it is not for the betterment of everybody it is a uh, bondage and and that is going to cause trouble uh, for for sacrifice practice works right um, o, o son of kunti becoming free from all the attachment is key so now this sacrifice today you know you guys know the terminology yoga so we're going to talk about this new terminology called as sacrifice which is yagna uh, y a g n uh, which is uh, something that I'm, I'm not sure how many people might have heard of that um, but um so we'll just jump right into it so yagna is uh so typically back in vedic time uh before vedanta happened um, you know was uh, summarized separately uh, there there are still these rituals right so even today these are the hinduism rituals where you uh, sit along a fire and you're offering all kinds of things like uh, oil or um, you know, like uh, uh, wheat or any kind of grains and all of that, right? So part of it is you're you're chanting the mantra, and that is supposed to uh, help you um, get something from God, right? That 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 was the whole uh, point of uh, yagna. Yeah, yagna basically is done like this. Now yagna can mean sacrifice or it can mean action. Uh, action as an offering, right? So that is what we will uh, focus about. Uh, focus here. Action that brings people together reduces one's ego that they have done everything. So this notion that I am doing it, right? Arjuna had this notion that I am fighting this war. I am going to be responsible for uh, winning the war and I am going to be responsible for killing a grandfather and so many people. Uh, but that was not true, right? Uh, and, and in any activity that we do, we have this sense of entitlement that, hey, you know, I deserve that result. I deserve that reward uh, because I did it, right? So this doership, I did it, uh, that is the cause for a lot of suffering. Uh, so what we have to do is we have to step back, even though you have done your part, uh, that doesn't mean you have done everything, right? So that is what we are getting to here. Um, so that is what uh, Arjuna is getting being taught in that section there. Our body plus pride in work, instruments, efforts, uh, infinity, God, right? So I call, I mean, I, I don't particularly like the terminology God, but God is used here. God can have so many connotations, but this really has nothing to do with God. <laughs> it is just this understanding of this infinite uh, uh, thing or oneness with other human beings um, and uh, uh, that the, all of this kind of participates in your, um, you know, uh, whatever good has come out of your action or even bad, right? Um, so God also, God's grace can also mean um, the in, innate power that exists in whatever you uh, raw material that maybe you needed to build your whatever activity that you're doing, right? That did not just, you didn't create that. You, for example, gravity. <laughs> gravity is there. Uh, so gravity is one of the gods in a way, right? So this is given to us. Uh, and this is not something human beings have created, right? So there, there are so many such things, right? These are the, um, the qualities of uh, uh, Prakriti, if you will, the nature. Um, now, sacrifice to me, as I said, has a notion of transaction. I sacrifice for you, hence I deserve the reward, right? So that is something. So offering is a better uh, terminology that I will be using throughout this. Uh, offering has a notion of service duty. I have done my part as best as I can. That's it. That's all the right that you have. And, you know, you, you cannot say I deserve that reward, right? Uh, so Prakriti has the gunas, right? We talked about this, tamas, rajas, and sattva. They are interplaying. That is what results into karma. You know, when you have more tamas, as we uh, saw, um, uh, I, I don't know if I want to go there, but yeah. Um, but, you know, the, these are the three qualities, right? So tamas is inertia. Rajas is something like, think of it like a soldier action. Uh, they want to always do the action. Uh, sattva is like, he's more into 
uh, brainy activities, right? So they are not into action. Uh, so they, um, we tend to be, most of us tend to be rajas, right? Many of us tend to be tamas and there are few of us are sattvas. Um, and that, that sort of leads to uh, so many different karmas on this planet uh, that might be good or bad, right? Um, uh, profession is the activity or, or what we are uh, not meant to do, but what we have come to offer to this world. Uh, it could be all kinds of things, right? It could be, and so the, the, this sort of took on a bad um, direction in India. Uh, where it uh, uh, amounted to being a caste system. So a priest's son would always be a priest or Brahmin would be a, become a Brahmin or a king's son would become the other king or even a businessman's son would become the businessman or a um, janitor's son would become the janitor, right? So, so here, the way um, Krishna uh, tries to, or Bhagavad Gita clearly says that which is completely lost to Hindus, <laughs> is that it is really not by birth. It is really something that comes with you innate within you, a certain quality, certain tendency towards like, oh, you know, you are probably good at that. Or if it is assigned to you, you can also assume that that is something that you're serving the society by providing that action. But most of the time, we are in this desirous uh, level of living where desire basically means that, hey, this I that I know, I don't like this, but this other thing out there, grass is always greener on the other side, right? So you always want to be something else. Once you reach there, then you want something else, right? So the, whatever you have, you're never satisfied with it. That is the, the cycle of desire. Uh, there is a uh, this is a really neat uh, story that uh, one of the Swami mentions is, um, he says, um, the, um, so there's a poor man uh, and they, I mean, in, in, in a, they call this Fakir. Uh, so the, in, um, in Muslims, I guess they would mean as uh, like monks, maybe, I guess, or, or poor person, but, uh, you know, they, the, or vagabond, I guess. I guess that's what it means. Anyways, so he is really upset, like, oh, man, you know, I wish there was a way to get all my sorrows. Uh, you know, get, get, uh, some somebody should get rid of all my suffering, right? He's a poor person. Um, and he also thinks that I wish, I wish there was a way for me to, you know, even if you cannot get rid of my suffering, God, can I exchange my sufferings to somebody else? <laughs> Else's suffering. Uh, because maybe maybe that other person's sufferings are not really sufferings for me. Can I can I can I possibly do that? So he's just pondering about that. And then because he's overthinking about it, you know, he goes to sleep and then he starts dreaming. And in the dream, basically, what happens is he gets uh, uh, this wish granted to him, and there is an announcement that comes about in his uh, 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 in wherever he's living that, hey, listen, guys, you know, come to this hall, X, Y, Z, you know, bring all your uh, laments and sorrows in a, in a bag and bring it along with you. And you will get a chance to exchange it with anybody you wish to exchange it with. And uh, he is just ecstatic about it. And he says, okay. And here he packs a bag of all his sorrows and he starts walking out and he sees everybody's walking out and you know, some have big bags, some have uh, small bags, and he notices that his bag is really smaller than everybody else's bag. So his suffering is smaller, but he says, that can't be true. You know, like my suffering is not smaller than theirs. And uh, he says, oh, but you know, those guys might be weak people. So they might think that their suffering is much larger than what I think my suffering is, right? So they all reach this hall and uh, you know everybody's welcomed and they say they, there's a bunch of these uh, hangers around uh, where you can tie those bags um, and uh, the uh, the uh, the guy says uh, you know whoever's the owner uh, he basically says okay you know there's going to be a whistle and everybody can go tie their bags to this hanger there'll be another whistle and you can walk over to anybody else's bag and pick his bag um, so that is that is the the thing that they're going to about they're about to do, and uh, the whistle happens, and then you know um, they put put their thing, 
the second whistle come uh, when they put put up their thing you know he is uh, he's again noticing like all these bags you know d- different sizes and what happens is because of all the travel uh, the bags have gotten loose and things start poking out of these bags right so now now you can actually see what are the sorrows in there uh, that the these bags have and uh, um, so the second whistle comes about and um, you know he uh, this uh, our poor person uh, fakir he just says oh mm. Okay, the whistle has come about. He runs to his bag, his own bag, and he grabs it immediately because he, you know, he says, the problem that is <laughs> known to me will be less of a problem than this other guy's problem. And then he notices that everybody else has really just picked their own bag. Uh, so it's just an interesting story about like, you know, the 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 uh, the desires that we have, which is like, you know, we we think that our sorrow is something that is completely, um, you know, it's different from the other person's sorrow and, you know, maybe uh, grass is greener on the other side. Anyways, that that I thought was a really neat uh, thing. But all of, all of this stuff here is really based around the desire, right? Kamana or Vasana. Um, so so uh, the point of yagna offering our actions is purifying the action, right? Uh, yagna... Um, uh, so anyways, I, we don't need to read about this. There's a lot more coming here. So he also says here in the in the verses that uh, it sacrificed a lot of creature of the old created creatures, right? So this is when the inception, you know, this is when the whole planet started and said, by this, by this meaning, this sacrifice, this, this notion of you sacrificing for the rest of us, rest of everybody. Um, by this, shall you bring forth fruits or offspring? Uh, let this be your milker of desires. So this milker of desire is kind of interesting because in, in, the, um, in the Sanskrit version of this, it has something to do, something to do with uh, this terminology called as kamdhenu, it's a, it's a, it's this uh, divine cow <laughs> um, w- who can fulfill any of your desires, right? So this, this terminology is kind of related to that. Uh, fostered by sacrifice, the God shall give you desired enjoyments. Who enjoys their given enjoyments and has not given to them, he is a thief, right? So, uh, so sometimes you know you will get these benefits. You know, during COVID, a lot of people got money from the government which they did not deserve. <laughs> so. Uh, that is, they are thieves. Uh, this is what Krishna is saying. You know, you will get whatever you wish, you will get it. But if you if you were not meant to get that, you are a thief. Um, uh, from food, uh, so so then he goes about explaining how this comes about, right? Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about that. So here, the gods that they talk about is kind of interesting, right? So uh, there is there are these. Uh, you know, what do they say? They are 3.3 million gods. You know, India has 3.3 million gods. So what does that that even mean? Um, the This is such a misunderstood concept. Koti is a terminology in, um, in Indian language, meaning, uh, what is it? Like 0.1 million, I guess, 100,000 uh, is, uh, no, 100,000 is lakh. Koti is how much? I don't care. Whatever. It's just a bunch of zeros on top of one, right? More than a million, definitely. Um, so, um, or no, 0.1 million. Sorry, I'm confused about this. Whatever. Um, so, Koti can also mean a, a category, like a group. So, there were 33, co- there are 33 Koti God, mean 33 different categories of gods, is what the scriptures were trying to say. And, um, these are the highest skills, um, like, you know, heat in fire, you know, fire has heat in it, or a flow in water, gravity, like I mentioned earlier, right? So these are some innate qualities that we humans have not done anything to achieve this. This was a God-given thing, right? So these are those, these are those uh, things that we pray to when we say that we are going to pay, pray to gods. So the God is in that fire. We pray fire, pray for fire because of that heat. We pray uh, uh, for the rivers and rain and all of that stuff, right? And then also the planet Earth, right? Um, so divine manifestation is key, right? So uh, after all this praying, action originated by Brahman, self, God, right? Whatever you want to call it. 
Um, that is the, the reason you want to have not an action uh, directed by uh, or created by senses or mind, but all the way from the self is that so that, you know, it's not related to ego or uh, sense pleasures, right? Um, so in the next uh, verse there in the book, he talks about um, it's a gift or, or we already uh, read about this, right? So yagna is a gift from God to humanity and everything. Uh, animals desire, right? Animals can desire, but humans can dedicate their action. They can devote, they can offer, right? So we only humans, maybe animals have it too, but at least from what we know is that if I do something, I might be doing it for myself, but you know, when you have a family, when you have a wife and kids, and you know, it's a it's a loving whatever family, then you know, you start learning this thing about sacrifice, where you're really doing something for the child, even though it is hurting you. And that hurt really doesn't really matter at all, as long as you can see the child happy. Now, this is up to the family, then it grows into the society, right? So this this notion of offering or devoting or dedicating your work to something is really a very human quality and the fact that we act mostly desirously only for self uh, uh, purposes or uh, to bring in more belongings for yourself that is very much like an animal is what uh, the the scripture is going to say um respect the nature's contribution in the act right so whatever you do you did not create the heat in the fire so at least you know, pay respect to the nature, uh, understand others' involvement. You know, when you say, I have done it, there are more people that might have contributed uh, to it. Otherwise, you are a common thief. Um, action by God within oneself as service to God, right? So we talked about the, the how you can, when the senses are gone out of control, mind can control the senses. When mind has gone out of control, your intellect can control the mind. When the intellect goes out of control, to control that, when can an intellect go out of control? That is where ego can get built. So when the intellect is trying to do an action that is whatever, um, you know, that action needs to be considered as an offering. Offering to the service, uh, to the society, or, you know, the society is really, you know, it is God. So God has two ways to be looked at. Uh, God is either a creator with uh, createes, which is us and the planet. So it is kind of like a sculptor who does a, a statue and the sculptor is sitting outside. So it's dualistic. There is that. The other way to look at God is sort of like a dancer. A dancer, the dance itself cannot be separate from the dancer. So you need the dancer as well. So uh, that is the notion that uh, Indian scriptures try to bring about, which is God is everywhere. This is God. This this whole thing is God. You know, even the worst people on the planet are also part of that same God, right? Uh, so whatever you do, you know, you go to your office, you work there, that work you need to be, you want to look at that as a service uh, done to whatever, right? Uh, cause. You could be the CEO of the company, right? But even a CEO can have a lot of humility and that that uh, that helps uh, in a lot of things, right? Then there is this growth cycle that Krishna talks about. Yagna uh, uh, helps our offering, helps rain, and then food comes about, life comes about, and then that goes back in the yagna and then this cycle continues. Now, what does that mean, right? So this is kind of interesting. And one of the swamis explains it like this, right? So we are meant to prosper. This life has been given to us to prosper. We like growth. We like to, you know, um, be better selves of ourselves, right? That is what it is meant for. And what do we need for that? We typically need nutrition, and that is food. Rain gives us food, right? When And rain, apparently, at least in the sans Sanskrit word that they use, there are other meanings for that word. One of the meaning is when everyone comes together. That is good for prosperity, for self and for others. So that that is uh, that is one of the things that, uh, that this might mean. Uh, Sashi, Sashi. Yes, yes. Can you, can you maximize the screen? 
you you if you change to the uh to the uh slideshow on the view oh okay 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 yeah yeah that'd be much better thank you uh, okay okay and uh yagna gives us rain offering one's action as service brings us together right so this notion that i am doing something rather than just for me but it is really for others it really makes others start loving you <laughs> right it starts building this notion of teamwork if you were in the office uh, environment or even at home or or whatever in the society right so uh, the, the the this particular section really covers that right so from food all of that happens um and so the point here he is trying to say to arjuna is that look your action is not just your own action so don't let it go to your head um and so he wants he then he then goes about that and then he basically says that it was even by works that janaka and the rest attained to perfection if you uh, read the upanishads and um a lot of uh, other scriptures uh, janaka is one of our philosopher kings um, and he stayed as a king throughout his lifetime, but he was also considered as a big philosopher, uh, and uh, he is very revered. Um, so he, Krishna actually brings him here. He says it was even by works that Janaka um, and the rest attained to perfection, right? So they were perfect. They were also, in Krishna's definition of a renunciate uh, or, or a reached soul or a yogi or a sannyasi, he would say that Janaka is a sannyasi, even though he was a king. You know, he he enjoyed all the royalties and everything, but he was he was such a good philosopher, and he still did his actions, right? So he's trying to tell, remind Arjuna, think about him. Thou shouldst do works regarding also the holding together of the peoples, right? So it's not just enough for you to think about yourself. You know, you're worried about yourself. You know, like what is going to happen to your family and all of that. But you haven't thought, you know, look at everybody, helpless people, so many helpless people. You're the only one who is a warrior and has this power to kind of uh, help this society. They're really looking up to you and you are really not, um, you know, you should not run away from this. Whatsoever the best doeth, that the lower kind of man puts into practice, right? there is another thing this is really really also one more thing that you know when we are doing our actions um there is a i'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about social media here right so we tend to want to advise others all the time so social media is all about finding problems in other people you look at all the tweets and everything right hey you know you should do this and then is some something good they hear like oh you know these are the five steps that you do, you know, whatever, something good is going to happen, blah, blah, blah. And then what you do is you just post it. You post it and you let others uh, do this. So uh, uh, one of the things that Oscar Wilde says is advice is best given to others. <laughs> so it's it never really, uh, you know, you never really apply it to yourself. Um, so when you are doing the yagna, where you are offering, you know, remember the yagna is that action that you have done not with your senses, not with your mind, but with your intellect, but as an offering to the God, right? So karma yoga, that yagna, you want to always think about every action that you do is how can you be the role model for the society? You cannot just go around telling people that, hey, you know, you should not be eating meat or you should not be uh, hurting the planet or you should not be, uh, you know, doing all the plastic waste and all of that stuff, right? You know, we eat organic, right? So we, we're always advising others, right? That, that, that Krishna is warning against being condescending to others, right? So he's saying, just do your thing. Do your thing because everybody's watching, even though they're not really watching, even even the, your parents are watching you. You know, you could be a role model to your parents. Like I, um, I, I feel like I learn a lot from my daughter, uh, you know, or my son. Uh, so that happens. It has nothing to do with age. It has nothing to do with your power. It is just how you act. You're not even like doing it so that somebody is going to say, oh my God, you've done such a great thing and I'm going to do it. No, that's not the point. Assume that somebody's watching you. When somebody's watching you, how can it be a role model 
for that person. So he is saying, always do that, right? Whatever action you're doing, be a role model. So here he's saying, Arjuna, if you're going to run away from here, imagine if people just did that, this society will be a chaos. You know, we society exists because we are all helping each other. And he says, you know, everybody's looking at you as a warrior, important warrior for this war. But if you are going to run away from this, that's not setting a good role model. So be here. There are so many soldiers who are not your brothers and sisters. They are here to fight for you. And here you are running away because your grandpa is going to get killed. Uh, so he he's warning him against that, right? Every object should manifest divinity in the subject. So this is another thing that Swami talks about is that this world, objects, there's so many objects here, our thought process, our anger, our fear, whatever, everything, right? Everything. It You want to use that to manifest divinity. What does that even mean? Manifest divinity does not mean like Jesus is going to come down or Krishna is going to come down. That's not the point. The point is that whatever good, whatever de you consider as divine, be that yourself, right? So, you know, if you want happiness um, uh, from some activity, uh, somebody is going to bring me happiness. No, when you're doing the activity, just be happy. That's it. When you're happy, you're doing the activity, that, that is happiness. Don't wait for the happiness to come after a result is going to come to you, right? So, so everything in this world, whatever good, bad is happening, politics, you know, your business, your uh, Wall Street, your, you know, whatever, everything, war, fights between husband and wife, all of that can be used for your self-growth. So you can step away, not step away in the sense, oh, look, wifey, I'm not going to fight with you. No, that's not the point. You engage in that conversation, but watch how you are getting angry, possibly. The moment you watch your anger, that anger dissolves into forgiveness. You know, that, that is one of the things that uh, they talk about in uh, some Upanishad that I forget right now. But the, the point is that if you take this notion of a witness of yourself doing something, that act itself becomes ridiculous. <laughs> and you, you change your format. You know, they, they said, right? Like if you're angry about someone and if you want to really respond, if you just wait for 24 hours, your response is going to look so much different the next day. I think it was Dale Carnegie or something uh, who had that in his book. Um, so nothing should disturb our mental calmness, right? Typically, it's way if your mind is just wavering and like you get really super uh, anxious or angry or you know whatever, that means that there's the desire has crept in. So you're not really in that mode of doing the actionlessness. Um, our senses detect. Um, I sees the object. Our mind registers it, uh, intellect comprehends, consciousness. Uh, okay, so let's just get back to this. So that's, uh, so yeah, I mean, we, we tend to blame everybody except yourself, right? So this is where, you know, uh, when we are on the social media, when we are on whatever, right? So literally this thing is gonna explode as we go further, right? Metaverse or whatnot, everything. It is gonna keep exploding. So. The point is, how can you bring back all these worldly experiences for your self-growth? Whatever is being put out there, look at yourself and think about, is this, whatever my reaction is, is it coming from my senses or my mind or my intellect? And am I really doing it as an offering to the society or the God, right? You know, whatever I'm doing. Uh, so that that is going to bring a different uh, quality of life, I guess. Um, so let's see. And when you're on this path, it is going to be tough. So you definitely, the one of the things he says is you really need, in Indian language, this would be called a shraddha. Shraddha is like faith and belief is like vishwas, right? So belief means that, oh, you know, I, I, I want to believe this, but, you know, I still have doubts, but I'm going to believe it because you're my friend. But faith is different, right? Faith has nothing to do with your religious faith or whatnot. It just means that, like, let's say if I am going to want to become a, I'm, I'm a 10th grader. I have no idea about this world. I don't know what this education is going to lead to. 
but I know I want to do this. Like this is what is going to be good. So I have to put some faith in that teacher, in that university that I'm going to be signing up for, that something good is going to happen. And I'm going to practice all the books that they're going to give to me, all the lectures they're going to give to me. And that is what he's going to, he's, he talks to him. He says, uh, Krishna says in one of the uh, verses that you're going to need faith in this. Faith is absolutely going to be key. This is not easy. And don't hurt yourself. <laughs> Be patient with yourself. It is going to take a lot of time because these habits that have happened to us has happened over a lots of years and lots of conditioning has gone along the way. So it's going to take some time. And then there is this uh, notion of like, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, what are, what is my duty? Like what, how do I find what am I good for? Um, so, there are there, there is this uh, idea of uh, um, sobhava. Uh, it basically means that this is my character. Like I, I'm an angry person, or I'm I'm a I'm you know uh, I I I uh, I like certain like I don't like outdoors maybe, or I like more outdoors, or you know. So there is some this innate quality. There is something that you know we already have. These are habits and traits. Um, and in the, these, uh, these sometimes, you know, if you tend to act based on that, um, they tend to be mindless in the sense that you are really like, they can become mechanical actions. Um, but Swarupa is where you have gone beyond the intellect and now you are questioning, not quite questioning, but really like whatever this sense wants to do, like, you know, there is a cake in front of me, my tongue wants to taste it. <laughs> uh, so, so my mind is in dilemma and the brain is thinking about it. And, uh, you know, you are watching all these activities that are going on, right, as, as a consciousness. So that is that mindfulness, acting consciously, mental. Um, uh, so typically in your mind, you know, um, so one of the one of the uh, Swami basically tries to um, uh, explain how to think about uh, the like what is the what is, how can you use God in in a in a, a positive way in your life you know there there are there are a lot of these people who go around with these little beads on their uh, fingers and then they kind of roll it uh, like a million times and he says that does nothing that's not the point the point is that you know. Our mind, even if we have closed our eyes and we are in a Zen state, uh, you know, not quite Zen, but, you know, our, our so-called contemplation or meditation state, our thoughts are always like this, this chain of thoughts immediately start in our mind. Just close your eyes, go to a quiet place, close your eyes and say, okay, I'm not going to think anything. Uh, literally in half a second, you start thinking about your, you know, maybe your kitchen door or you know, fridge and then what's in the fridge and then what am I going to have for dinner, blah, 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 right? And you end up in some place that you were like, you, it will just completely surprise you. So, and then uh, people might say that, oh my God, that is bad. Um, so you need to stop that, right? But you cannot really quite stop that. So one of, one of our uh, important monks uh, was Raman Maharshi. Uh, he basically says, let, the, let them come. Let those thoughts come. It's okay. But what this guy says is that, you can just, when that happens, right, think of any deity you want, Jesus or Rama or whatever. You just utter that name and that sort of breaks the chain of thoughts because the idea is that these chain of thoughts lead you into a place where it's all built up in your mind, but that starts causing some kind of a pain or su suffering to you without even actually it happening out there. And you might feel way elated about some person or way bad about some person, even before that person has done anything bad or good, right? So and that is what you need to break. And that is the mindfulness stuff, right? So when, when we are thinking about meditation and uh, uh, stuff, you could utilize God in a positive way, right? Um, so uh, there would be an inner calling uh, which um, is typically out of our control. Um, they, that 
that you would know over time you know in in a family even with the same kind of uh, upbringing you will notice that both the kids will typically have different traits and um one might go into a musical direction and the other might go into engineering or something right so that is something that they have come with and that that is that is what is this swadharma um, is that they are going to find that inner calling uh, and that is what will uh, guide you to identify what your true um, action is on this planet. How can you be best when you are offering or servicing uh, this society? So I'm not sure if I should keep going or should I take a pause here? Jason, what do you think? Yeah, I think that you, so uh, I, I used, I think you are still on the uh, chapter three. I think so. So I can, I can just uh, keep, uh, uh, let me, let me just. So you uh, want to pause here, they have a question or you want to finish chapter three, then does it have a question and then okay. we probably have to do uh, chapter four. Then fine. Okay, let me, let me finish this. Yeah, you're right. Let me, uh, let yeah. me kind of uh, jump through this. Oh, so we have another 40 minutes. So, oh, okay. uh, uh, giving so up I, I will finish uh, chapter three and uh, they have okay. a question and discussion. Okay, so, so why does he say you want to give up the offering? We talked about this, right? Giving up thy works to me. This me he's talking about here is not Krishna, but really that larger self. And, you know, Jesus uses similar terminology, right? In, in his uh, uh, whatever. Uh, with thy consciousness founded in the self. Give up thy works, uh, right? Uh, free from, why do you want to do that? Free from desire and egoism. Fight, delivered from the fever of thy soul, right? So you want to do this really uh, with full heart, right? All existence follow their nature and what shall uh, coursing it avail? Uh, even the man of knowledge acts according to his nature. We talked about that, right? So there is there's this inner calling that you want to follow. Better is one's own law of works, swadharma, <laughs> though in itself faulty, right? So this is another thing, right? Um, we tend to be doing something and we suddenly see like, oh man, I wish I was a lawyer. Like maybe I'm an engineer. Oh, I wish I was a lawyer. And I start like thinking about uh, law or something right in the middle of the career. And, uh, you know, which means that I'll have to uproot everything and, you know, start all over again. And um, or or somebody might have told me, like, hey, maybe you should try law and, you know, you're going to make more money, blah, blah, blah. Right. So um, what what Krishna is trying to say is that don't doubt what you're good at. So whatever you're good at, it is better for you to continue doing that, even if you're not on the spiritual path, because that is better than you going uh, on a wrong path because Arjuna wanted to become a monk, right? Even though he's a warrior. And he says that um, better is one's own law of works, Swadharma, as a warrior, thou, though, sorry, though in itself faulty, then an alien law well wrought out. You know, so this path of knowledge, path of monk might be good for Buddha, but definitely not good for Arjuna is what he's saying. Death in one's own law of being is better, perilous is it to follow an alien law. Now, one more thing I, I just want to kind of uh, uh, bring here in this is we really don't know when this thing was written, um, but the overall Indian um, religious, uh, you know, growth, if you will, how it happened, you know, from the... Uh, Indus Valley and all the religions came about and, you know, uh, then Buddhism came about, Jainism came about. There was this whole thing around Buddhism when it came, it was a revolt against uh, Hinduism, right? Uh, so they said that these Hindus, uh, they have become very corrupt, the priests, and they are really causing so much pain in the society. And uh, so Buddha comes up with this totally new concept it is rooted in Hinduism. A lot of his concepts are exactly the same as what Krishna is saying, but he chose the path of becoming a complete beggar in a way, right? So his, his most primary thing was that begging is the way to live, drop all your belongings, go away, right? 
and that became very fashionable back then uh in a, when when buddhism came about it was very very popular and what happened is there was a total chaos in the society a lot of people were leaving their houses and you know there was a sort of a, a malaise if you will right so it it was just not good for the society so a lot of the hindu scriptures that came about uh, be it shankaracharya or a lot of these people uh they and i i I don't know. I don't know, but maybe may, I don't know if Bhagavad Gita was written about then or was it written earlier than that. Uh, but there was always this uh, Hinduism, uh, the highest point or the the best path there was always about renunciation. You know, becoming a monk or becoming a priest was always considered as the best thing that you can do, and which is what Buddha does. And you know, the society gets into a chaos, then the Hindu uh, folks sort of come together, try to bring the society together with the understanding of Vedanta saying that, look, this is what it is. And whatever you're going to be, do as a monk or a sannyasi or a, or a renunciate, you can do that here, living in your family, you know, how you behave with other people, you can behave as if you're a renunciate. You know, you can still show love, you can do all your actions. And a lot of this dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, it kind of, to me, seems like it is uh, trying to kind of balance out this notion in Hinduism that renunciation is the only best path. And uh, Krishna is basic, basically saying, live in this world, this is the best sannyas, or this is the best uh, thing you can do for yourself. Um, so Arjuna asks here, but what is this in us that drives a man to sin, right? So the, this is, uh, again, I think we have talked a lot about the desire, so I'm going to skip that. And what happens to this desire is that as a fire is covered over by smoke, um, as a mirror by dust, as an embryo is wrapped by the amnion, so this knowledge is enveloped by it. So this is really key, key in the sense that... Um, you know, deep within us, we do have this knowledge. We have an understanding. But what has happened is, depending on the nature of us, like, you know, some people are very close to the understanding. Some people are very much in darkness, right? So this covering that has happened, that blocks this knowledge, and we are all running, you know, uh, helter-skelter because of our desires, um, it can have severe and less severe consequences. For some people, it might just be like a, a fire is covered over by smoke. So you just kind of wipe away the smoke and you can see the fire. It might be as easy as that for people, some people. For some people, it might be as a mirror by dust, right? So you have to actually pick up a rag and kind of clean it, right? So think of this first one as the sattva, where he's already very close to the knowledge and it is easy for him to like, you know, just uh, waft away the smoke and then immediately he can see the knowledge. For somebody, you have to pick up the rag and clean the mirror, but there might be another kind of lazy people, tamas, tamasic people, who it is kind of like an embryo is wrapped by the amnion. So it is very, very hard to get to the knowledge uh, for some of the people and they they choose uh, to uh, stay in darkness. So I'm I'm going to cover a little bit of next section and then I'm going to stop uh, in another, like, let's say 10 minutes. Um, so one of the things that uh, um, he continues, right? So here, notice every chapter, Arjuna starts with a question. But here, after he's presented all of this stuff, you know, he he feels like, oh, you know, Arjuna is now, he, he kind of get, gets a sense that I think he's understanding or he is willing to learn not understanding, but willing to learn. Uh, so he comes out with even more profound statement here. Uh, he says that uh, this imperishable uh, yoga or this knowledge, right? So this, this karma yoga, I gave to Vivasvan, the sun god. Vivasvan, the sun god, gave it to Manu, the first man, right? And then that first man gave to his son, which was Ish Ikshvaku. Uh, he was the head of the solar line um, or, or the so solar dynasty at that time. Now, this has a very like, a, oh, you know, there was a God and then he, there was the sun God 
you know, you talk to that sun god and then the sun god talk to this first man, all of that stuff, right? But there is another way to understand this, which is uh, that um, when he says I, I is uh, the, uh, the consciousness that we have talked about, the self, uh, the sun god sort of re uh, um, is the, if you will, the intelligence, right? And then Manu, the first man, is uh, the the mind, and uh, Ikshwaku are the senses. So the knowledge is deep within us, and it it is passed along through these channels, right? And and that knowledge is imperishable. It has always been whoever reaches, right? No matter where he is on the planet. It could be Jesus, it could be Muhammad, it could be Krishna, it could be whoever, Buddha. If you look at their teachings all the way to the, you know, the final essence of their teaching, it is so similar, you know, and what they're talking about. They might be trying to solve the puzzles for a warrior, or they might be trying to solve the puzzles for the slaves, uh, you know, in Egypt or whatever, or some anything else. You know, ultimately, if you look at their philosophy, it really boils down to something very similar all across. So that's why he calls this as very imperishable, right? Um, and uh, the, this is uh, kind of interesting um, to comprehend that again. So uh, let's see. I can just flip through these slides and see if there's something interesting here. Uh, yeah, Ikshwaku, this name is kind of interesting. As I was reading on Quora, somebody had explained this. Uh, Iksha means being, looking, and Vaku is desire. And that's where that not, that uh, understanding comes about is uh, when combined, it means desire attractor, which is what our senses are, right? <laughs> so uh, Ikshwaku also means like a sugar and bitter gourd. Uh, so together, right? Uh, so that the, the senses are sweet and horrible at the same time, uh, if you will. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, they, they, then he talks about what is an avatar uh, because he is uh, explaining that there are so many things that happen, uh, humans get born, but once in a while when there is so much darkness on the planet, then an avatar is born. It is sort of reincarnation of God. But the way to understand this is way back, uh, you know, at least uh, they, there must have been a personality by the name Vishnu. But Vishnu is also one of our gods. Um, but this Vishnu might have done some really amazing act. And through generations, the memory of that act has sort of morphed into be, making him like a superhuman, right? Uh, and that those superhuman qualities, we tend to, like if somebody shows a very superhuman um, behavior on this planet, like Buddha, for example, we tend to say he's a reincarnation of that, that Superman, uh, Vishnu, right? So that is sort of like the notion of uh, Avatar. Um, and then and then this, uh, the sannyas and sadhu, we talked about that, right? So here, again, he tries to convince in chapter four to him that really, you don't have to go to the forest. You don't have to go anywhere. Sannyasa is here. You can be here. You can be renunciate in the sense that you don't desire for things. Uh, and you can still continue doing your actions, right? And uh, we talked about that. We talked about that. Action and actionless. We talked about that. Um, ultimately, you know, the, the, the whole chapter is uh, is in Indian language, at least, it is called as, uh, let's see, it is called as Jnana Karma Sanyas Yoga. Remember, we are reading from two different books, right? One is the translation from Aurobindo Ghosh, and the other is from Gandhi. Uh, so Gandhi's book will have this name, uh, Gyan Karma Sanyas Yoga. So trying to go do your renunciation with absolutely no knowledge or karma is idiotic, is what Krishna tells him. That is, a lot of people do that. They are not the, doing the right thing. That is not how you do it. So you really want to understand knowledge is key. And that is what he says. This is ultimate offering that you can give to God, you know, or whatever, uh, infinity, uh, is, you know, you are giving up your desire, you're giving up your senses, 
you are going to be controlling your mind, all of that, right? Belongings, you're not going to be amassing a lot of wealth, blah, 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 or you can, uh, but you know, you do it as if it's an offering for the society. But really, ultimately, all of these, it's kind of a ladder. So you're not going to be stuck in one place. You are going to be moving on to all you're doing is to understand yourself, understand that self that is acting through you. And that is the final offering, he says, right? And then, of course, you know, you want to go into sannyasa and all of that stuff. But um, but uh, that, again, again, confuses Arjuna in chapter five. Uh, he says, oh, you know, you tell me about dissolving actions by doing the, uh, the, the karma. And then you want me to do karma. And then you also want me to offer it uh, to somebody else. And it's, so that's just very confusing, right? What is the, what, you know, explain to me what renunciation is, which is what chapter five is going to be. All right, I'm going to stop now. <laughs> Sorry about so that. So you finished to chapter four? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, good. Cool. So you take 90% <laughs> of time doing chapter three. And then... <laughs> I know, I know. That's what happens. I think chapter three is sort of interesting. I would say chapter two is by far the everything is given in chapter two. Like if you just read chapter two, from there on, it's all the details, like all the way up to 18, which are, which are marvelous because we all are like Arjuna, you know, confused. So yeah, questions guys, anybody? Yeah, I had a question. Uh, so you were talking about uh, uh, Manu, right? And uh, uh, if you go by the a definition, uh, um, Vishwaswata Manu is uh, the seventh in the uh, cycle. Um, okay. So do you have any notion of like uh, the timeline of like when this might have happened? Uh, if you go by the Chaturyuk cycle, it states that uh, uh, current uh, Kali Yuga is like around 420 years, uh, 420,000 years and then Dwapar Yuga is when is supposed the Mahabharata is supposed to happen, which is about eight hundred thousand years, and towards the end of Dwapar is when Mahabharata happened. This is what the current, uh, you know, thought process is, uh, which many researchers believe would have happened close to three thousand five hundred BC. Uh, mm -hmm. And and if you go back further, you were talking about Ishwaku as well, right? Who was the starting of the starting of the dynasty, Sun Dynasty, in which Sri Ram uh, actually uh, inherited, right, and and that happened in uh, uh, Treta Yuga, which is supposed to be 1.2 million years, and then Satya Yuga is 1.8. Mm -hmm. So this is just one cycle, and then there are several of those cycles. So how would you uh, you know quantify the timeline? Like, uh, do you have any notion? Well, about well uh, oh, I uh, one. Uh, well, the very uh, in my first lecture, I mentioned that um, I have absolutely zero interest in uh, timeline or historical accuracy. I have no interest. I if if somebody proves to me Krishna did not exist, it doesn't matter. The message is important, uh, and I I hope to God that there was a person like Krishna. I hope to God that there was a person like Jesus, for that matter, or Muhammad, for that matter. Right. Uh, so these people, uh, these uh, these characters exist. Uh, for us to learn something. And how does it impact my life if uh, it was proven that this happened uh, so many million years ago? So my interest is not really uh, about history or timeline, but uh, what is interesting to me uh, when I read about these millions and millions of years or how back our Puranas talk about is uh, it's just this um, notion of timeline, right? So this the 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 cycle of time you know like it, it everything comes and goes and everything you know the dwapar yug treta yug satya yug dwapar so there are four yugas guys right satya yug is the best yug dwapar is the next yuga or a total cycle of time where some things happen then there is the treta yug third yuga and then kali yug that is the fourth yuga we are part of the fourth yuga where everything is going to be destroyed and then the satya yuga starts again right so there is this infinite notion of time in Hinduism versus uh, other religions. They have different notion of time. Uh, so that that is important for me. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I I really don't have. Sorry, I don't have the information on that. Yeah, but that that was good. Good point. Thank you. Um, 
Oh, Roth, I have a question. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I have a question about the uh, rejection of the idea of action for results. I mean, it seems to me that text is not entirely consistent on this. And you've mentioned some examples of also of things being virtuous because of their results. Um, in the text in particular, it, uh, in, I think this goes back to chapter two, it says that Arjuna has to fight. If he doesn't fight, he will bring shame on himself and people will uh, scorn him. Well, that's an ethic of results. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a couple of other things. You mentioned that this was this war between the Pandavas and the Kauravas was a just war. Therefore, winning the war would make the world would make society better. Again, right. that is that's, also a result. Yeah. That's also yeah. a result. You mentioned if somebody sacrifices something for their child. Presumably that's a good thing, but it's also for the benefit of the child. Um, you, I guess you said if, and I guess, I don't know whether this was specific to Arjuna, if somebody runs away, I guess, from action or from something, this will result in chaos. There's a result. I, wa I, wonder, I yeah. wondered if you could yeah. just look into right. this. Do we really want to completely get rid of an ethic of results? Or is that also significant? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a very awesome uh, 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 view uh, or, or, or an observation. Um, so this is how I, I understand it, right? Um, that, or, or, you know, I've, I've also had uh, people mention that, uh, Swami's mentioned that. So um, action without a result. So what does that mean? So when we, when we are, taking an action with complete focus on, a, on the result, why do we need, why do we want to achieve the result? Because the result is going to make us happy, right? That is, that is always the situation, isn't it? Um, so the idea is that, no, you disagree with that? Well, to, uh, in the case of the war, to make the society a better place. Yeah, but it now, is going to bring about happiness. Okay, so, for, 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 always, the, for everybody. For everybody, yeah. So okay. yeah, so uh, so I think always a result is associated with a happiness that is about to come. So um, so the point that he is trying to make when you are doing your actions is that when you think about before you come to an action uh, and you're about to act, uh, but then while acting, your mind is completely uh, sort of uh, biased with the result, considering the result. So there might be two things, right? You might get the result or you might not get the result. So you might win or you might lose. And uh, if you think you're going to win, uh, there is something good is going to happen and all of that stuff, right? So, when, so in this case, what happened with Arjuna, with the war, is that he already projected his win. He projected his win, meaning the opposite party is going to die. That was not given. So, they, so to go into a, an action with that much ego is the problem that he's talking about. He's saying, what, what gives you this right to even say that, you know, you are actually going to get kill your grandpa? The grandpa was a great warrior. The, the, there was, they were the best warriors on the other side, too. They, he could get killed. He doesn't know. So he's saying that don't bring your desires to win because you think that this is what is going to be good or your fear that, you know, uh, you're going to cause so many deaths. Um, and, you know, the other, the, the other thing is what happens if you lose, right? Uh, and maybe, maybe with Arjuna, it would, <laughs> it would probably be okay with him, right? Because he already wanted to give up. Um, so the point at least in the context of that war, is that his confusion comes about because he's already projecting his win. That confusion would not have happened had he just kind of like, uh, just not even considered that he might win, not even considered that he might lose. Similarly, now how, can, how does that impact to us uh, uh, um, in our situation, right? When we are acting, when we are acting, uh, first of all, right, I think uh, we, 
we don't tend to do actions <laughs> many a times what we are doing is reactions so somebody has put something out there you know in the society as an attraction or something we like or something we don't like and we tend to most of our actions are reactions to the society the pure action is the like the spontaneous action so you just like ah you know i just i'm just doing it right so that does not happen first of all that's uh, so, you know, the action can be as simple as like, oh, you know, you want to uh, get angry at somebody or you want to uh, fight uh, something bad that is happening in the society or whatever, right? So the, the way we go about it is always a reaction and it is it comes about with a um, notion of uh, like, oh, you know, um, I I like this or I hate this. So the like and hate drives our, uh, our reaction in a way. Uh, so we are already trying to win that thing that we like, and we are trying to destroy that thing that we don't like. So that that particular thing, whatever is going to come about, your action is biased as you're going about it. So that is one way to look at it. And that biased action is only going to result in a uh, suffering in the long run, even though you get to whatever you like, maybe, maybe you're trying to win a girl or something, I don't know, uh, or, uh, you know, you, you, you hate your neighbor or something, right? So that, that is what, so all, all of this is really pointing to is there is a distinction between action and the doership. So doership has a notion of ego and that ego comes about from the fact that that doer has a desire so all krishna is trying to say is distinguish an action from a doer don't take the responsibility you have been called upon taking that action don't let that result go to your head and don't let the failure go to your head and there's there's another way to look at it is when you are about to set on the path to that goal so you already have that result, right? That result is going to bring about an happiness after the result comes about. Well, don't think about the result. So you know, you know, you the direction is clear. You want to go that way. Now drop the result. So you are working on it. The happiness that you're going to gain after the result is going to come, express that happiness now. As you're on the path, the path itself is the result is what one way to look at it is you know be happy along the way because if you go in into the action with the stress of the result that action is already now you're 50 percent on that action right the point is like you, you can you can tone down the focus on the result and now you happily do your action on the path be on the path now you're 100 percent in that right in the action itself and more than likely you're going to do a better job um with with that approach so th there are there are multiple ways to look at this uh in, in with different contexts and it, it is quite a useful thing i would say um in a way yes we are goal oriented that's what drives our prosperity and all of that but i think attaching to the goal uh can affect our efforts that we are trying to put in that action so then i have a question on the uh, yakna, yakna. Uh huh. Okay, you keep talking about yakna, but in the text I don't see yakna. So what's... oh yeah, yeah, that is the Sanskrit name. In text, he talks about sacrifice. So yakna is a sacrifice. sacrifice. I sometimes you talk about offering. I, I don't like sa sacrifice. I like to call it as offering. Um, so it's kind of like you know, um, the the yakna basically would be like a fire, and you would put things in fire. Okay, that was the ritual part of it. But the idea is that when you were doing this sacrifice or an offering in this uh, uh, ritual, you are basically looking at uh, items in your life that are very close to you. And how, what, how would it impact you when you give up that particular activity or that belonging? Does that make sense, Jason? 
Yeah, okay. So yeah. that's so, okay. So if you go to the chapter four, verses 28, right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So he talk about the offer of the striver and reading the uh, three. Uh, oh, yeah, the offering of the striver. So the offering, right? should we read as Yagna? Sorry, yeah, let, let, let's read that. The offering of the striver, right? The striver is somebody who wants something after perfection, maybe. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, the offering of the striver after perfection. So there are different kinds of yagnas is what this this particular verse is talking about. Some people might be after uh, dravya yagna means they want some material uh, uh, thing or a physical thing, right? Oh, so that's they, what they want. Not what, what they, they want, need. right? So okay. then, they, then they offer. So they tell God, hey, look, I'm going to give up a cake for one year. And can you give me a son, right? So it's a transaction that you are kind of bargaining, right? So you offer your craving for uh, the son, uh, for the cake, and then you say, okay, I'm going to get this in return, right? Or it may be the austerity of his self-discipline. So they, the many times people will say, okay, well, I'm going to uh, always uh, bike ride to the office, God. I'm not going to drive the car and can you make, uh, you know, increase my salary or something. <laughs> so that is the self-discipline path, right? So there is, there is the, there is the material path. There are material prayer offerings. There is the self-discipline prayer offerings. And then there is, um, what else? Energy of oh, oh, yeah, yes, no. uh, yeah. And then there is the yoga yoga. So we, we do yoga for body. So think of this, right? There is the material, there's the self-discipline, and then there's the body. So you want to, you're also sitting quietly and you're doing this uh, breathing exercises, right? All of those yeah, yogas that you do. The yoga, why do you do yoga? Because it is going to bring you some perfection, some perfection. So you're craving after that perfection, right? So that is also an offering. And, or it may be the offering of reading and knowledge, right? So a lot of people say, hey, you know what? I'm going to read this. I'm going to learn about this thing. It requires sacrifice, isn't it? We are not going to be watching Netflix. We are going to be sitting and reading this stuff. So that's an offering to him, uh, to God. But he next, he says is uh, others who are, uh, so he next one, he talks about prana means breathe control. That is also an offering. And he keeps going down, right? The list. Others have regulated food, um, immortality, right? So that is what they want. Um, but he, at some point, he says that ultimately the sacrifice of knowledge, number 33, he says the sacrifice of knowledge, O Parantapa, means Arjuna, is greater than any of the sacrifices that I have told so far. Knowledge is that in which all this action culminates. So what he's saying is, let's say you're after material, right? Let's say you want a million dollars. And so you, you, it's fine for you to get those million dollars. That's fine, he says. But that is the first step in the ladder. Then let's say you want to do some self-discipline where you have come to an understanding that you're not going to eat so much sweet or ice cream or whatever, right? And then you come to an understanding that, oh, I need to work on my body, right? So, so all of these things that you're sacrificing Ultimately, he says that there is one more step that you want to take, which is understand the self. Gain that one knowledge that is so important for you to gain. It's what, what happens is many, many times people get stuck on this ladder and then they are either stuck in gaining more material benefits or they are very much busy in this yogic thing, right? Where they are doing the yogas and doing the yogas every day and then they, they think that they're going to achieve. He says, no, just by doing yogas, you're not going to achieve anything. It's a waste of time. He says that these efforts are supposed to, for you to climb. Everything is for transcendence. Everything. You know, whatever I'm doing, you're presenting uh, Chinese literature, you're presenting so many things. I'm presenting Hinduism. This is not just for presenting sake. This is for me, my soul, to feel better or go to that next step, right? Any action we do, we want to think in terms of how, where am I on that ladder? And he is not criticizing any of those steps on the ladder. He says, you're material, materialistic. That's okay. That's okay. At some point, you're going to climb that next step. Right? That's what that, that means. 
Does that make sense, Jason? Okay, so basically, some the translation is sometimes called the offering. So, for example, I have the problem with, like you said, on the 33, right? Right, the right. The sacrifice right. of knowledge. Um, what they mean? You lose uh, your knowledge or you gain knowledge? Oh, no, no, no. Oh, okay. That's that's a really good question. Okay. So, now, see, the unfortunately... Well, I got a confused. Like, let, you know, let, okay, let, I give up my knowledge, right? Yeah, let, let, me, let me explain that, right? So, sacrifice of knowledge means that you know, it is easy for me to, um, like if an ice cream is kept in front of me, I always bring up ice cream. I think I love ice cream. Uh, but uh, if ice cream is kept in front of me, my tongue would want to taste it. I want to eat it, right? But to control those senses, it takes effort. So you are going to sacrifice something, the joy that you might get by eating the ice cream, right? Mm -hmm. That is sacrificing the senses. Yeah. Then it's the mind. So when it comes to mind, you have the dilemma. You say, oh, you know, do I want to do this? This is going to help me. That's not going to help me, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's always in uh, relativity, if you will. Mind is always like, this is better. That is not better. This is better. That is not better. Let me take this easy path. And that easy path might be destructive to the society, but you still do it like throwing trash everywhere or drinking uh, plastic bottle water and <laughs> throwing plastic everywhere, right? So that those kind of things, right? So there, the... Now you say, mind, shut up. Let me think about this intelli intelli intelligently. So you are controlling, you're sacrificing what you would have naturally done to some better path, right? That's a sacrifice for some. So I naturally want to study Bhagavad Gita. Then no, 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 hold on, hold on. I'm getting that. I'm, <laughs> get, I'm getting step by step there. So now what happens is you have come up to intellect. Now he says that you want to sacrifice the knowledge itself, right? So these learnings here, what he's talking about is sacrifice of knowledge. You're not sacrificing the knowledge. The knowledge that you have gained, right? When you even rise above the intellect, now what you're saying is everything that I do, everything that I do is not for me not for my family, not for anything. This is for God. To that itself, it is easy to say, but to do it, it's extremely hard. Okay. But when you start doing it, what would happen is maybe your belongings are going to go down. Your possessions are going to go down because you're, you're not going to be greedy. You're not going to be profit-minded, right? You're not really participating in this culture of greed, right? And you might become poor. So it's a sacrifice in a way, but that sacrifice is the most important sacrifice. And what, what is happening is you're gaining the knowledge, the right knowledge, the only knowledge that matters. In some chapter later on, Krishna talks about it. People spend so much time on learning so many things. None of it matters. Once you know that knowledge that, is, that kind of guides everything, everything that you do, all the actions you do are always good actions. Are they good for the society? Then it is okay for you to learn physics. Then it is okay for you to learn nuclear science. Then it is okay for you to manufacture the atomic bombs as well. But you're not going to be doing bad at that point. So but if, please, you don't so have, if you don't have that fundamental knowledge and then you are acting in this society, which is what is the condition for all of us, what happens is we are we have created a society that is ultra chaotic. We are hurting the planet. We are causing, you know, everybody is profit minded. It is the materialism, right? And this is in fact what Arbindo Ghosh, right? His stress about as India was becoming independent uh, from Britishers going out, he was very much against the notion of Britishers just leaving the country. He thought that India needs to, they, we need to create this, he, he called that person an integral man or integral yoga, right? So uh, it was a very loftier goal, I guess. A lot of people didn't quite understand what he was trying to say, but it is a good goal for us to think about as we are becoming more and more of a citizen of the world rather than a citizen of a country in a way, right? We still belong to a country, but we still have to act as if I'm going to impact the little country out in South Africa, for example, whatever actions I do here in a prosperous country like America, right? So that that is the thing, right? You know, so we, so I, whatever I sacrifice 
whatever I say, oh, you know, I don't want to do this because it might impact whoever. That is a that is a sacrifice. That's an offering, right? Okay. So so sacrifice analogy basically is the purpose is to step up. Yes. Okay, yeah. I got you. So I I I think that that helped a lot. Okay. And also and also and also people get stuck in the knowledge itself. Yeah. People don't get stuck don't in the book. Attend, just in the book. Just attached no. to the knowledge. Yeah. Wisdom. Knowledge is not wisdom quite, right? So once you get that ultimate thing, drop the knowledge. You know, it's like Buddha, I think in some Zen story, Buddha says, if you come across me on the path, kill me. Yeah. So you, yeah. you just throw away the Bhagavad Gita, then you know yes. everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, true. Uh, so sometimes these things that come through books is actually kind of uh, handicap. It, it makes us handicap in a way because we're not really self-exploring. Uh, what happens is we think, oh, somebody said honesty is best policy, so let me do it. As against, no, from inside, I feel that honesty is the right thing, right? Two different things. I'm either doing it because the book says, and that book is praised by a lot of people, or am I really feeling it from inside, right? So yeah. for that, I might have to lie, and I might have to do all kinds of bad things to realize, wait a second, that really was not good for the society, and that's why I want to be honest, Right. Okay, anyway. so that, we run out of time, and uh, sorry, AG sure, sure. Will wait for a long time, and uh, then oh. yeah, you have the last question, please. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, Sashi, uh, so really thank you for you know uh, doing this thing. So, if you can briefly, there are two things that I wanted to ask. So, one is you talked about uh, Satvik, Tamsik, and Ratsik, right? And uh, those are generally the qualities. Uh, it is said that you know kind of food that you eat also can be divided into these three categories and it impacts the behaviors that you have so that's one question and the second question you uh, was pointing out that yoga is about exercise so i wanted to just correct the, you there that it's not about exercise no, no, it is not exercise is just, the way just our society the way our society understands so the way our society just, understands is ask my question so that you can talk after that uh, yeah. so so yoga, so as, as you understand, there are multiple areas. So one is uh, basically yoga, which is uh, karma yoga, which is about work. Then you have bhakti yoga, that is about like your devotion towards the God. Uh, and then you also have, uh, you know, uh, meditation basically. Uh, so it is uh, basically dhyan yoga. And there are multiple others as well. So only in the US society, it is thought of as exercise. That's not true. So just Correct. wanted to you know, point you to that direction as well. So no, no, so I, you... I already that is exactly what I my point is that yoga a lot of people understand even in the old ages, right? Uh, the breathing exercises and that is what people were stuck in. In fact, that is what Krishna is commenting there in uh, one of the lines here, right? Uh, I don't know, is it oh thirty twenty nine, right? He says controlling the every you know the, they're controlling their breath. And uh, they think that, yeah, you know, that's something really uh, good. So, uh, but that, that, is, that is one step. So you want to go beyond that, right? So everything is, you want to use it for transcendence, you know, going to the next step. You don't want to get stuck in anything that you're doing, right? Anyway, so that's good. Cool. That's it. Okay. Anything All right. about the food, the food items? That, that was the first oh, question. I the food, uh, the sattvic, rajasic, and tamasic about the food part, right? Uh, it kind of, I think, uh, the whole rest of the chapters, everything is going to be about those three qualities. I, I guarantee you that he's going to cover that. But the notion that some kind of food are sattvic and others are tamasic and all of that, I think um, there is a quality of uh, when you eat food, it kind of uh, creates a certain kind of uh, mentality. You know, like if you're drinking a lot of uh, alcohol and all of that, that is very rajasic. And so, you know, you tend to do whatever you do. Uh, the sattvic will eat uh, mellow foods, you know, simple foods, or maybe not non-veg. But um, um, I, I'm not too worried about that. Like, I, I'm not really too concerned about that. Ultimately, what it means to me is that there are these three gunas or three attributes given to every element in the society that, can, that drives their action. Now, when that action happens, what you can do is you can think about that action in the terms of what Krishna is saying. Don't, don't get worried that, oh, you are very materialistic or you are a butcher or you are a thief. That's not the point. Think of your action as a transcendence vehicle. 
right? There are so many things in Mahabharata, actually, there's a butcher who actually becomes a uh, advice giver. So there's a, there's a small booklet about that, where he becomes a person who gives uh, Vedic knowledge to a Brahmana, which is completely opposite, right? So this is a butcher who is like uh, in the meat thing, and he's considered as the lower caste, but he has deeper knowledge than that Brahmana. So that, that shows up many times. Anyways, yeah. Okay, so that's 